Um, well, I must say, I'm very impressed with this. Uh, this meeting room is amazing. I feel like I'm in a waterfall. And it's really lovely here. Um, and that was incredible, uh, incredible performance. Uh, so I must say, I'm quite delighted to be here this morning talking to you um, and to experience this, this wonderful event uh, and everything that uh, uh, Indonesia has to offer. It's uh, amazing being here in, in Bali in Indonesia. So, um, and I, hopefully everyone saw the, the mangrove forests. Uh, because those are very impressive. It's uh, several hundred thousand uh, acres of, of mangroves uh, that I think have been re replanted, if I recall correctly. Um, so there are a lot of great things happening in Indonesia and, and the rest of the world. Um, and uh, overall, I, I would say I'm quite sort of optimistic for the future. Um, I think the, you know, we should never be complacent or entitled, but I do think that if we're not complacent and entitled, that the future will actually be great for the world. And I, th I think we're headed to, to a bright future overall. Um, so, um, and with respect to, to water, I've always thought, uh, you know, we, should, we, we, we call Earth, Earth, but, but actually Earth is 70% water by surface area. So we should, technically, I think if, if aliens came here, and a lot of people think aliens have come here, because um, they're always, always asking me, they're always asking me about aliens. Um, the, um, they, would, they would name us water, because we are 70% water and only 30% land. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 what that means is the potential for solving any given water issue is extremely good because there is so much water. Um, the, there's obviously desalination required at times and the transport of water, but desalination, as I think most people know, has become very inexpensive, um, and, is, uh, and so really the availability of fresh water is simply about uh, energy and transport. Uh, so that's, uh, when I talk to even very well-read, very, very smart people uh, in the United States, they will often think, well, the water crisis is unsolvable, but in fact, it is, it is very solvable. Um, and uh, with our continuing breakthroughs in the efficiency of, of, of desalination. And um, anyway, I think we've got, a, we've, got, we've got a great water future ahead of us, uh, and I think a great sustainable energy future ahead of us. Yes, um, so anyway, hopefully that is, I'm basically I'm kicking things off on a positive note, uh, but I think with, with good basis for, for doing so. Um, yeah. With, with that, I think, I think the next section is really just some questions or Q&A if anyone would like to ask me anything about anything. Um, I, I suppose we should generally stick to the topic of water, <laughs> given that it's the water conference. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to answer other questions as well. I'm not quite sure how, how the logistics of question posing works, but you could just say a question. Uh, you sure. If I heard correctly, what is the most important thing for solving the water crisis? Okay. Um, well, the exact solution will vary depending upon country and even region within a country. Um, but the, as I mentioned, the, the, because the cost of desalination has dropped so much, um, if, uh, if you're just talking about water for individual consumption or water in, say, a hydroponics facility, some kind of um, you know, we're not simply put it, putting it on the ground for crops, but actually have some sort of contained facility that minimizes the amount of e evaporation. I think you can basically turn any part of the world green, including the entire world. So it just begs the question of where does the energy come from? Um, and, and here's where I think uh, solar energy is very much um, underestimated in terms of its capability. So if you think about what would the Earth be without the sun, the Earth would be a frozen dark ice ball at roughly three degrees above absolute zero. Um, it would be quite, quite unpleasant. So, or, you know, un very cold and dark. But because of the sun, we are not, we're at a, quite a nice temperature, quite pleasant, um, sort of roughly 300, 300 degrees above absolute zero. 
And the sun powers almost the, the entire ecosystem is solar powered. When you say like, well, how much electricity, how much land would it take to generate uh, electricity? Um, there's a, a gigawatt per square kilometer of solar um, radiation that reaches the surface. So for every square kilometer, there's a peak power of uh, roughly a gigawatt, which is uh, comparable to a power station. Now, the sun doesn't shine all the time, obviously. Um, so when you, when you net all of that out and say, well, wh how, wh how much energy per day does one square kilometer yield? It's roughly one gigawatt hour per square kilometer per day, which is still, still a lot. So, uh, and if, if you do the, the rough math to power the United States, uh, which is a heavy user of electricity, uh, would only take, would, would take less than a 200 kilometer by 200 kilometer solar array, power the entire United States. And if you drive through, through the United States, there's plenty of sections of, of the United States where there is basically no people. Um, or another way to think of it is a small section of the Sahara could power all of Europe um, or, or the world. Now, I'm not, not saying you would be so concentrated in the placement of solar power because it's better to be more distributed. Um, but the sheer magnitude of solar power that is available is often not quite understood. But, but the math of it is very clear. So I really would strongly recommend sort of a solar plus battery combination of, uh, or wind plus solar uh, can solve all of the world's energy needs by, by a lot.